Um, good afternoon. I'm Mike Romano, Chair of the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code. We'll get started in just a minute as the um, participants and um, members of the public populate our Zoom room. Thank you for coming. Okay, um, as I said, I'm Mike Romano and I'm chair of the committee of the revision of the penal code, which is now in session. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to begin with a brief announcement. As many of you know, former assembly member Sidney Comlager was recently elected a Senator for California's 30th Senate district in Los Angeles. And we offer our congratulations and thank her really for her exceptional participation on this committee. Law governs that our committee requires that there be one member of the Senate and one member of the Assembly. As such, Senator, now Senator Comlager will no longer be a member of the committee. On Monday, Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon, Rendon appointed Assembly Member Alex Lee to fill the vacancy. Assembly Member Lee represents the 25th Assembly District, um, which includes parts of Alameda and Santa Clara counties. Uh, because the appointment was just made Monday, Assemblymember Lee may not be able to make all of today and tomorrow's meetings, but we want to welcome and, him and we're excited to have him as part of our group. With that said, um, today we're here to discuss capital punishment in California. I think it's safe to say that there is no area of criminal law that is more emotionally, politically, or legally fraught and complicated. As such, it fits squarely within this committee's mandate to examine and make recommendations to simplify and quote, rationalize criminal laws in California. As many of you know, California has the country's largest death row. More than twice as many people are in prison on California's death row in San Quentin than the state with the second largest death row, which is Florida. Since 1976, over 1,000 people have been sentenced to death in California. In that time, only 13 have been executed, and the last execution in California was in January of 2006. I don't want to brush over the fact that each of these people have been convicted of horrific crimes. The crimes often caused horrific suffering, involved multiple victims, and left surviving victims, family members, and friends with a loss and anguish that I can't fairly imagine. At the same time, I don't want to brush over the fact that while only a relative few number of capital cases have been fully adjudicated in California due to a Byzantine system of appeals and post-conviction procedures, which we'll discuss today, a majority of death sentences that have been fully litigated in California have been reversed for constitutional or some other legal error. It is our job to look at California's laws as dispassionately as possible, and I have repeatedly stated my belief the criminal justice policy and our recommendations should be driven as much as possible by the data. It has been 13 years since the state commission has taken a deep look at the death penalty in California. While we will not try to duplicate the excellent and exhaustive work of the Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice, we hope to build on that legacy, acknowledging the commission's, that the commission's three main recommendations, increase funding for death penalty cases, narrow the scope for death eligible cases or abandon the death penalty altogether have been largely ignored. Even the most cursory history of capital punishment in California since the commission report in 2008 reveals the complexity of the issue. In 2012, California voters narrowly rejected a ballot measure that would have replaced the death penalty with life without parole for the most serious crimes. The following year, a state court of appeal enjoined executions in California by lethal injection for failure to follow proper procedures. In 2014, the state's death penalty was ruled unconstitutional by a federal district judge in Santa Ana who ruled that the sheer length of time involved in fully adjudicating death sentences yielded arbitrary outcomes in violation of the Eighth Amendment. In 2015, that decision was overturned by the Ninth Circuit, but not because the decision was wrong on the merits, but because, but because the case was not properly fought, filed at the right time. In 2016, the next year, voters again rejected a ballot measure that would have eliminated the death penalty and instead enacted what's known as Proposition 66, 
which promised to fix and quote, speed up California's system of capital punishment. In 2018, startling evidence of innocent people on death row came to light. The California Supreme Court reversed the conviction of Vicente ben Benavidez Vicaroa, who had been on death row for 15 years. The court ruled that false and recanted evidence was used against Figueroa at his trial, and the death in his case may have indeed been an accident rather than murder. All charges were later dismissed. The same year, the New York Times also published the first of multiple investigation or investigative articles uncovering serious concerns that people on California's death row, in particular Kevin Cooper and Michael Hill, may be innocent. The Times quoted Ninth Circuit Judge William Fletcher, who I respect greatly as asserting bluntly that Cooper was framed. In 2019, Governor Newsom carried out a campaign pledge by signing an executive order that imposed a moratorium, halting all executions in California and closing the death, get death chamber in San Quentin. Last summer, the Supreme Court of California issued an ex unexpected order in a case called People versus McDaniel, questioning how jurors vote to impose capital sentences and asking the Attorney General to brief the issue. That order was issued, was followed by another startling development related to the, net, to the McDaniel case when Governor Newsom filed a brief before the Supreme Court arguing that, quote, racial discrimination infects the administration of California's death penalty, unquote and that its current application violated state and federal law. Uh, we'll hear today from one of the governor's lawyers in that case as one of our witnesses, uh, Elizabeth Semmel. Just one week later, George Gascone was elected district attorney for Los Angeles County on an, and on his first day in office announced that he would never seek the death penalty and further that he would um, work to recall the death sentences imposed by his predecessors. A death sentence is never appropriate resolution in any case, he said. Gascon then joined sitting district attorneys from Santa Clara County, Jeff Rosen, San Francisco, Chase Boudin, and Contra Costa, Diana Becton, arguing in the McDaniel case that the death penalty as applied in California is unconstitutional. Then just yesterday, two important developments. First, a significant a national development as Virginia Governor Ralph Northam signed into law to eliminate the death penalty in that state. It is the first Southern state to end capital punishment in the state which I believe has executed more people than any other state in the country. And second, also yesterday, Governor Newsom of course appointed Rob Bonta to be California's next attorney general. As relevant here, as an assembly member, Mr. Bonta co-authored a bill to ban the death penalty and saying at the time flatly that quote, the death penalty is wrong for California and I oppose it. So in summary, we have a death penalty in California, which voters have repeatedly, albeit narrowly, endorsed in three separate ballot measure elections. We have a state Supreme Court questioning the legality of California's death penalty law. We have federal courts questioning the method, protocol, and regulations governing our executions. And we have the state's two highest law enforcement officials, the governor and attorney general, openly calling for outright repeal of capital punishment in the state. I think the situation is aptly summed up by a poll of California's taken in 2019 showing simultaneous support for Governor Newsom's moratorium and support for keeping the death penalty for certain horrific crimes. In short, we're in a legal, political, and moral stalemate on the death penalty. Against that landscape, today we'll hear from people whose life work it is to study capital punishment. These are truly some of the nation's experts on the issue, on the history and constitutionality of death penalty, its efficacy as a deterrent, its cost and reliability, its value to surviving victims, and disturbing evidence that the death penalty works as a crucible for racial prejudices that pervade the entire criminal legal system. And I look forward to hearing from them. Uh, so before beginning, uh, do any members or staff have any questions or statements to make? All right. Um, no. Justice Moreno? Uh, no. Oh, good. Um, excuse the siren. Thank you for indulging me. All right. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, our first panel. Uh, Carol Steiker is a professor and co-director of the Criminal Justice Policy Program at Harvard Law School. Jordan Steiker 
is her brother and professor of direct uh, and director of the Capital Punishment Center at University of Texas Law School. And Sean Kennedy is professor and executive director of the Center of Juvenile Law and Policy at Loyola. <laughs> uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Carol Steiker, would you uh, mind kicking things off for us? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, on behalf of my brother, Professor Jordan Steiker, and myself, I thank Chair Romano and the committee for the opportunity to speak to you today. Jordan and I have worked together for more than 25 years on scholarly advocacy and law reform projects related to capital punishment. Of these activities, the project that is most relevant to the work of this committee is our report to the American Law Institute, the ALI, evaluating the success of its model capital statute. In 2009, on the basis of the report that we prepared, the ALI voted to withdraw its model capital statute, which provided the template for the current California capital statute, and indeed for all modern American capital statutes. The grounds for this decision was the ALI's conclusion that there are, quote, intractable institutional and structural obstacles to ensuring a minimally adequate system for administering capital punishment, end quote. The New York Times spoke in plainer vernacular, writing that the ALI had concluded that the capital justice system in the United States is irretrievably broken. We have provided the committee with an article that we wrote describing our work for the ALI, which includes the complete text of our ALI report. I will take just a few minutes now to describe and contextualize our work for the ALI and look forward to the discussion that will follow. The ALI is the premier nonpartisan law reform organization in the United States. In the criminal field, the ALI embarked in the 1950s on an ambitious law reform project um, of promulgating a model penal code, the MPC, which many law students are familiar with. The MPC committee initially proposed abolishing capital punishment in the model code, but the ALI leadership worried that the MPC would not be influential in the states if it took an abolitionist stance on the death penalty and instructed the committee to formulate a model death penalty statute as part of the MPC. They did so and the ALI formally promulgated the MPC with its model death penalty provisions in 1962. For the next decade, the states basically ignored the model capital punishment provisions of the MPC until the Supreme Court decided Furman versus Georgia in 1972, which constitutionally invalidated capital punishment as it was then practiced across the United States on the grounds of its arbitrary and discriminatory application. Not surprisingly, many states that wanted to bring back capital punishment after Furman turned to the MPC. In 1976, the US Supreme Court reviewed five of this new generation of revised capital statutes and upheld three of them, the three that were modeled on the MPC. And the Supreme Court explicitly referenced the MPC in upholding this new generation of guided discretion statutes all of which use some version of the MPC's aggravating and mitigating factors. Thereafter, the MPC, MPC became the guiding template for the death penalty post-1976, um, the modern era of American capital punishment, and for California in particular, which passed its guided discretion statute in 1977. In 2007, a group of ALI members moved that the ALI should take a stand against capital punishment because its work had been so influential in bolstering the administration of capital punishment, despite its demonstrably continued arbitrary and discriminatory application. The director of the ALI hired Jordan and me to write a report for the Institute with the following charge, quote, to review the literature, the case law and reliable data concerning the most important contemporary issues posed by the retention or abolition of the death penalty, end quote, and to answer the basic question, quote, is fair administration of a system of capital punishment possible, end quote. A report to the ALI outlined the ways in which the administration of capital punishment is beset by fundamental problems, many of which are either impossible or tremendously difficult to fix. 
such as the politicization of the capital process, the problem of wrongful conviction of the innocent, the ineradicable influence of racial and ethnic bias, and the inadequacy of defense representation, among others. We urged the ALI to withdraw its failed model capital statute in light of the more than 30 plus years of evidence that it had not meaningfully ameliorated the original problems the Furman court had identified. We recommended against the ALA undertaking a law reform project in this area because there already had been so many studies and recommendations made by state, state legislative commissions, state bars, the, the American Bar Association, uh, and uh, very little in the way of effective reform that had followed. As we said in our report, a reform project would not likely succeed, but would delay the recognition of failure. Quite surprisingly, the ALI, which almost never sees a problem that it doesn't want to try to fix, accepted our recommendation and voted to withdraw the model death penalty provisions of the model penal code in 2009, the first change ever made to the model penal code since its promulgation, promulgation in 1962. And the ALI declined to undertake further reform in light of the intractable nature of the problems identified. The problems we identified nationwide in our ALI report exist in California as well. Some of them even in heightened form because of the particular provisions of the California capital statute and the operation of the state capital process. Our bottom line to this committee is emphatically the same one that we gave to the ALI. The capital system is irretrievably broken and the death penalty should be repealed. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Jordan Steiker. I'm going to speak to the extraordinary diminishing footprint of the American death penalty and the significance of that decline. The three clearest indications of the death penalty status are death sentences, executions, and the death penalty's availability within state criminal systems. First, death sentences. 25 years ago in 1996, there were 315 death sentences issued nationwide. 10 years later, by 2006, that number was cut by about 60% to 123 death sentences nationwide. Over the past five years, we've averaged about 33 death sentences per year nationwide representing an almost 90% decline from the mid 1990s. This is true despite a relatively constant number of homicides, murders and non-negligent manslaughters, ranging from about 14 to 17,000 per year nationwide since the late 1990s. We have gone from producing fewer than two death sentences for every 100 homicides to fewer than two death sentences for every 1,000 homicides. Executions likewise have declined. By the late 1990s, the United States was averaging about 80 executions per year nationwide with a high of 98 in 1999. Over the past five years, we've averaged about 21 executions per year, representing a 75% decline. At the present moment, we've gone over 250 days since the last state execution, the longest stretch in 40 years, though in the waning days of the Trump administration, the federal government carried out 13 executions. The number of states without the death penalty reached an all-time high yesterday with Virginia's repeal of its capital statute. 23 states have now abandoned the death penalty, with 11 of those states ending the death penalty over the past 15 years. Of the 27 states retaining the death penalty as an available punishment, 12, including California, have not conducted an execution in over a decade. The decline of the American death penalty has been driven by numerous factors, but probably the most important is the declining support for the death penalty by the American public. Opinion polls show dramatically weakening support with the gold standard Gallup poll finding at the end of 2019 that only 36% of those polled supported the death penalty over the alternative of life imprisonment. 
it's worth noting that the, the, death, the decline of the death penalty in the United States parallels the dramatic decline of the death penalty worldwide with every Western developed democracy other than the United States having abolished the death penalty, mostly within the last 30 years. Outside of the United States, the end of the death penalty has been largely viewed as a moral imperative and its retention deemed inconsistent with human dignity and the respect for persons. How does the decline of the death penalty in death sentences, executions, and authorizing states bear on the decision whether to retain the punishment in the California Penal Code? I'll offer two related points. First, as the death penalty becomes vanishingly rare, it is simply impossible to assert that it achieves any meaningful societal or penological purpose. When fewer than two per thousand homicides result in the death sentence, and only a fraction of those sentenced to death are executed, the death penalty cannot deter violent crime. Empirical studies generally have failed to establish a deterrent effect for the death penalty, even studies undertaken when the death penalty was frequently implemented. But now when the death penalty is such a marginal part of the criminal justice system, even for punishing homicide, the case for deterrence is foreclosed. Likewise, the argument that the, death, that the death penalty is important to serve retributive ends cannot be squared with the fact that imprisonment is deemed adequate punishment for the vast, vast majority of homicides, including aggra aggravated ones. As the American criminal justice system continues to function with the death penalty at the absolute margins, it becomes increasingly clear that the death penalty is not a needed or valued tool for punishment. Moreover, the marginalization of the death penalty heightens the likelihood of its arbitrary and discriminatory administration. States have failed to cabin the reach of their capital statutes so that in states retaining the death penalty like California, a very high percentage of homicides are death eligible. This combination of broad death eligibility and rare death sentencing and executions creates an intolerable risk that those very few persons selected to death will essentially be losers in a death penalty lottery, and that race and class and other illegitimate considerations will influence its rare distribution. Finally, and relatedly, as the death penalty footprint in the United States shrinks, the case for its unconstitutionality strengthens. The United States Supreme Court's Eighth Amendment's jurisprudence gauges a punishment's acceptability, its consistency with evolving standards of decency, by the very same considerations I've discussed, focusing primarily on the availability, its availability in state statutes and the frequency of its use. A punishment becomes excessive and unconstitutional when it no longer serves discernible societal goals or penological purposes, such as when its rare uh, use amounts to, in Justice White's room, the pointless and needless extinction of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Professor um, Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. I've taught death penalty law at Loyola for 20 years. Half my students are uh, gonna be prosecutors, half defenders. And uh, on behalf of Loyola, I wanna thank uh, the committee for the opportunity to weigh in on the California death penalty system which is a issue of grave concern to many Loyola professors and students. So I just wanna hit uh, three points uh, about the California death penalty. Um, first is the cost. California devotes enormous resources to uh, maintaining a death penalty system that has never really worked. And in 2011, Loyola Law School published a study showing that all of us in California had spent over $4 billion to achieve 13 executions in the modern era. Now that study's 10 years out of date, but one of the authors, my colleague at Loyola, Professor Paula Mitchell, has estimated that now the cost is $6 billion, even though there have been no additional executions since the original study conducted by herself and the late Ninth Circuit Judge Arthur Alarcon. This is roughly a half a billion dollars per execution. We have to ask ourselves, is it worth it? 
Two, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, racially uh, discriminatory application of the death penalty in, uh, in California. Many of my students focus on uh, Southern states and think that the death penalty is very discriminatory in the South, which it is. But our death row suffers the same problems. As has been remarked, we have the largest death row in America, 711 people and county. And the statistics at San Quentin are uh, uh, startling. They reveal that California applies its death penalty in a racially discriminatory manner. African Americans constitute 6% of the total population of the state of California, but they constitute 36% of the death row population. That wild and stark racial disparity calls into question the popular California narrative that spending so much money on our death penalty cases ensures that full due process and equal protection under the laws will be given to uh, all capital defendants. It's just not true. And the statistics reveal it. It may be that the newly enacted California Racial Justice Act will lead to a whole new wave of litigation, mining the racially discriminatory application of the death penalty in our state. And finally, I wanna talk uh, a bit about innocence because Loyola also has a project for the innocent. In 2019, Governor Newsom, as we all know, declared a moratorium on all executions, saying he feared uh, that he might execute innocent people. His concerns are well-founded in my opinion. The advent of the Innocence Project national movement has held up a mirror to the entire country and forced us to confront the reality that our justice system is convicting innocent people, including 185 death row inmates to date who have been exonerated. An additional 192 exonerations involve innocent people who squeaked by the death penalty because they were instead sentenced to LWAP, life in prison without parole. And a 2014 study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences concluded that there are many more innocent people on America's death row who we still just don't know about. Bringing it back to uh, California in our state, five men, all people of color, were sentenced to death and later exonerated. And my colleagues at the Loyola Project for the Innocent uh, currently have five cases under active investigation where they have unearthed credible uh, new evidence of innocence. And it's very difficult to get taken by that project. I assume the same is true in the other states innocence projects. So in all likelihood, we're going to see many more death row exonerations in the future. So in conclusion, I would just say that many states, we've just heard about Virginia, but many states have abolished their death penalty based on high cost, racial disparities, and concerns about wrongful convictions and executions. These same issues apply with full force in the state of California, and we should seriously consider abolishing our death penalty. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have a hundred questions, um, but I don't wanna monopolize the time any further. So I'd ask uh, other members if you guys have questions to chime in now, please. Yeah, Chair, this is uh, Justice Moreno. One of the things that's always uh, bothered me, and I think I wrote uh, a concurring opinion when I was on the Supreme Court, was, was the uh, great number of special circumstance allegations that we have in, in California. I think it's at least two dozen. And the fact that uh, you know a, a creative prosecutor 
could really make a special circumstance out of just about any kind of first degree murder case. Uh, I wonder what the current literature is on that and if there's been any movement uh, towards a position that I took many years ago that uh, those uh, death eligible special circumstance uh, elements should be reduced to you know, probably less than a handful if, if you're gonna have any at all. I mean, if you could just address that, that issue, I'd, I'd be very happy. Anybody? Uh, I mean, is, the, is the legislature gonna do something? Uh, is there any way of you know, cutting back the number of special circumstances? Have any other courts taken the position that you know, the, it's overbroad? The, the number of death qualifying circumstances? Well, I was gonna say that it's quite common that legislatures uh, reduce the availability of the death penalty, but almost all of them that have done it, like Maryland, which really shrunk its death penalty tremendously, end up then abolishing the death penalty. It tends to be more of a way station on the way to repeal than it is a permanent fix. And I think one of the problems is, is that it's impossible to keep the number of circumstances small because there's there then becomes some crime that isn't in one of the circumstances. And then you have legislation by anecdote, like we have to now we have to pass a new special circumstance that will include, you know, this crime that was committed that isn't covered. And that is, in fact, how um, this there's sort of what's called aggravator creep that they're just every state has seen an increase in aggravating factors or special circumstances as they're they are here in California um, unless and until a state is really very close to repeal so that tends to be the dynamic that we see okay I do have one one other question and one that I mean this deals with racial disparities and kind of the, uh, the accused versus the victim uh, issue. I read some of the materials that address that, I think a debate between Scalia and Justice Souter. And uh, there are just so many variables that go into that. And I just wonder how, you know, what the current state of research is on that and the validity that, uh, you know, black on, on white victim is disproportionate versus black versus black black victim. If you could just simplify that for my way of thinking. I, I can speak briefly to that. Um, I think there's been, the research I think has been remarkably sturdy in terms of showing a very consistent race of the victim effect. Mm -hmm. so, um, Non-white victims are extraordinarily less likely to produce death sentences. And the studies have also shown a remarkably sturdy interracial effect where uh, Black on, white, black on white offenses tend to be treated as the most aggravated um, uh, in a number of different studies, a number of different jurisdictions. When you, when you speak about this sort of debate about you know, whether or not sufficient variables have been accounted for to make the research sturdy enough, um, I mean, I, my sense from the, the folks who are the real experts in statistics, including David Baldus, mm -hmm. uh, is that it's just, you know, his research, the, the conclusion he reached in his own study um, was that the chances that the racial effect was not due to race discrimination um, was something like one out of a thousand was the chance that that was not the, actually the product of mm -hmm. a, a meaning, meaningful role of race and race discrimination in the Georgia sentencing scheme. And I think that was replicated um, to the same degree of confidence in the New Jersey study and in studies elsewhere. Um, and it's, it's not surprising because we, have, we know of a number of practices that infect capital proceedings that would likely um, be a vehicle for the race to be influential. Um, everything from jury, um, jury selection, which the, you know, I know in, in Texas and in a number of jurisdictions, it's just a, you know, a, 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 per, a problem that seems intractable of, of using peremptory strikes to, to clear out minority jurors from participating um, to prosecutorial discretion and the, the pressures um, and how much heightened those pressures are when there are white victims to seek the death penalty. 
um, versus in cases of involving minority victims. So I think the, I think the, the research I think is robust and, um, and I think it's consistent sort of nationwide and it's been intractable because there've been a lot of efforts to squeeze out the race discrimination. But the problem is there are too many opportunities for discretion to actually you know, get rid of the, the discrimination that goes along with the necessary discretion. Yeah, what, one of the questions that was raised in, in the reading, not directly, at least by myself, by my own account, was have they ever isolated the factor of whether or not the victim was known or a stranger? Because it would seem that if uh, an accused kills a stranger, a jury is more likely and a prosecutor is more likely to, to find yeah. a special circumstance. But if it's a familial thing or a fight, a spur of the moment, but then the people know each other, you're less likely to even find a death penalty charge in that, yeah, that case, was an, that's a conviction. I, I think that that intuition is exactly right. And it, it was definitely accounted for in the recent yeah. studies. They treat, they all of the studies treat as more aggravating uh, a stranger killing than yeah. a stranger killing. Um, and even controlling for that factor, um, there still is a very large race effect. Okay. Senator Skinner. Thanks, um, Chair. A couple questions. One, and uh, I think, Mike, you're the one who made this statistic, but maybe some of our other, uh, the, the researchers who spoke might have the answer. But um, I wondered, the you gave the number that there's been a thousand people given a death sentence in California since 1976. Do we know how many in the last three to four years? Has it dropped over time? or so, or even in the last five years? Yeah, it's been dropping in California, that's for sure. The, the counties that continue uh, to do it are mostly in the South, right? The North-South phenomenon of the death penalty, I guess, exists in California mm -hmm. as well. LA, mm -hmm. uh, Orange County, Riverside, and San Bernardino. I also think San Mateo County also up North. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it definitely uh, is dropping the past few years. I mean, when, when I graduated from Loyola in 1989, there were many death penalty filings, much less so now. Um, maybe, uh, Chair, we could ask staff to put together that so we could see that pattern over time. Um, and then also by county, that would also be very interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Then the other question I had is, um, I believe it was, uh, Mr. Kennedy, you referenced the um, journal in a scientific journal that gave a um, estimation of that there would still be um, people on death row that were innocent. Was that based on some statistical calculation in terms of how many had, you know, if you have a population and you've already um, exonerated X amount, was there was their estimation based on a statistical? Do, do you know how that estimation was made? Yeah, they, they definitely are extrapolating based on existing exonerations and pointing out uh, the many bars to uh, exonerating oneself after the state Supreme Court affirms the death sentence, which uh, any of us on the federal side know the, the enormous obstacles to litigating one's innocence and habeas because of the various doctrines of procedural bar and exhaustion and keep you from doing it. But the National Academy of Science is obviously very invested in a objective scientific approach and they're the one who published the study in 2014. Okay. I have one additional question. I'd like uh, insight from, from the experts. You know, I was on the, on the California Supreme Court and, and uh, I know that, uh, I mean, I read and I've been told that many of the uh, affirmed uh, death uh, judgments have been reversed by the Ninth Circuit. And underlying that criticism was a statement that the harmless air standard employed by the California Supreme Court was a bit lax. Uh, could you comment uh, on that? And how, how is the standard of affirmance on uh, or the reversal of Supreme California Supreme Court 
uh, cases, uh, how is the harmless air? You know, it's it's harmless air to the California Supreme Court, but not to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, could you address that? Well, I, I I'm happy to having experienced this multiple yeah. times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like our state has such a schizophrenic relationship with the death penalty. Mm -hmm. We pass more and more death penalties and uh, uh, we litigate them. But in the end, we don't want to be a Southern state that doesn't uh, uh, pronounce constitutional violations or enacts huge bars to litigating in the later courts. And so the California Supreme Court, which I have so much respect for, often calls out constitutional violations like Brady, non-disclosure, ineffective assistance of counsel, other forms of official misconduct. But whether it is through the application of the harmless error uh, uh, doctrine or the built-in prejudice determinations that exist in many uh, tests such as Brady and ineffective assistance of counsel, uh, they're, they're much more willing uh, to say that the error would not have made a difference at right. trial. Right. And I don't understand often as, as someone who has litigated death penalty cases, how the judges make a determination like that. And so when it goes to federal review, um, it just seems that the federal judges have been more willing to find that an error may have been prejudicial specifically at the penalty phase because of the understanding that a wide variety of mitigators can appeal to at least one juror sitting on the penalty phase and change the verdict. And uh, so I think that's why we see that over and over again. Judge Espinoza, uh, do you have questions? I'm gonna ask it, but I think it may have already been answered. Okay. Statewide, do we know what percentage of eligible cases in what, what percentage of cases in which the death penalty is an option it's actually pursued? And is that, and I, my takeaway so far is that number's declining whatever it is. Professor Kennedy? I don't know that. Either of the spikers? You know, I think I read this in one of the materials submitted to you from the uh, public defenders who said that we're talking about what percentage of cases are eligible for the death penalty. Um, and it was like 95, 6% of first degree murders and 59% of or 50 something percent of second degree murders. And then what percent uh, of cases in which it was sought? It was like four something percent. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's the, having just read that last night, like I, I don't have the point, you know, four point what, but it was something like that, four point something percent out of 95 or 6 percent of all well, first degree murders or, and almost 60 percent of second degree murders. So it was right. very much a shrinking number. Right. And I think, you know, very much dependent, as, as uh, Sean Kennedy pointed out on on where the crime was committed. If it was in San Mateo or the Inland Empire, uh, you're more likely to get the special circumstance or death uh, capital uh, death penalty sought in those, in those uh, areas. And one thing that's always perplexed me, I mean, coming from Los Angeles where, where Judge Espinosa also sat, you know, we, you know, my, my sense was that the, the LA County District Attorney's Office had a more rigorous review with the kind of a death penalty panel reviewing the cases and therefore uh, uh, maybe the overall number of homicides is greater but seeking the death penalty uh, in, in fewer circumstances. And my sense was that that kind of rigorous kind of review pre-filing was not done in other counties. Do any of you have any kind of insight into that? We, we do know that it all depends where in what county you're charged but I wonder what kind of review process some of those indicated counties actually undergo. It, it's certainly not a requirement, Justice Moreno. So yeah. prosecutors uh, do what they like. And of course, um, they're 
independently elected constitutional officers who some of them jealously guard that power. Yeah. But you're right, an L.A. County District Attorney, um, based after the early death verdicts, which I think were um, much less prudent than what you're talking about now, mm -hmm. they instituted a special circumstances committee where everyone would gather together and consider memos both from the uh, trial prosecutor and the defense team, which is at a disadvantage, of course, because they don't know everything and they're not in the room. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a reform that existed at LA County that I don't think exists in the other, uh, the, the other county surrounding us, um, uh, spe specifically in the Inland Empire. Right, but what about, I mean, at the federal level, isn't there, a, before they can seek the uh, seek death, isn't there a special committee that has to be cleared in, in DC? And, yeah, and just, the defense council has input into the process to put on kind of a pre-mitigating uh, evidence uh, as to whether or not it should be a, a death case. There's a central death committee that yeah. follows a similar pattern as the LA County Special Circumstances Committee. Again, you know, it's very hard for defense counsel who knows almost nothing to, is participating in that process, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and is not in the room the way the trial prosecutor may be when the committee does the kind of question and answer that we're doing here. Mm -hmm. I want to jump in here. I have questions for each of you. Oh, Ms. Oh, uh, Carol? I'm, I'm sorry. I wanted to follow up on my answer to Justice Moreno before because I found the site that I was thinking of, and it actually was in a different thing. And I'm not even sure it's part of the materials before you, but it's an article that I was reading um, called Death by Stereotype, Race, Ethnicity, mm -hmm. and California's Failure right. to Implement Furman's Narrowing right. Requirement. So That's that in David one of the footnotes. <laughs> One of yes. the footnotes of what was given to us. Right. So it was in one of the footnotes, and I went to read it, and here are the precise numbers. 95% of first-degree murder convictions qualify under the 2008 yeah. California statute as eligible, um, and only 4.6 of those persons who have committed a factually eligible capital murder were sentenced to death. So it's 95%, 4.6% of those eligible. 95% of convictions or charges? Charges. 95% um, of all first degree murder convictions qualify under the 2008 California statute as eligible for the death penalty. Well, as I said, I, I have questions for each of you, um, but before I, I get there, and I don't mean to put members on the spot, I, I know for certain, Justice Mourinho, that you've sat on courts affirming death sentences. Mm -hmm. Uh, Judge Espinoza, did you ever impose death sentence? You know, I made some very uh, strategic career choices that left me out of the death penalty loop. I had the option at the end of my term as the supervising judge of criminal to move up to the ninth floor, which is almost exclusively death penalty cases and yeah. chose not to, to sit there. In my previous assignment in the Southeast District, um, I quite intentionally avoided accepting volunteering for death penalty cases. Yeah. yeah. And that's how it works in LA, at least, that judges volunteer to. Well, I'm just talking about a small district. There are 12 geographic districts. So, in, in my district in the Southeast, if a death penalty case came in and didn't get transferred downtown, which was very rare, most of them came downtown to be handled on the ninth floor, um, you could step up if you were a criminal judge or had an all-purpose uh, all trial court. But it's, I wouldn't say that's a countywide system. It's just how it worked in the Southeast. The cases were randomly assigned. Um, but at yeah. the time of trial, if the calendar court couldn't accommodate the case, it would go out to a, um, an all-purpose trial court. And I just, I never had the opportunity, so. I yeah. wonder if the, judges being able to self-select if that also is another problem that's ever I wouldn't say it's self-select I don't want to I don't want to misstate it yeah. for a short period of time I had an all-purpose trial court I just never had the opportunity um, okay. to try a death penalty case and that was you know yeah but but you could always decline to go to the ninth floor also where you're more likely to get a death penalty case which I did. I just, I, yeah. I declined an assignment to the ninth floor because the ninth floor was almost exclusively death penalty yeah. Yeah. cases. And it just, 
you know, I had other interest in the criminal justice system. It's yeah. Well, I had I had many special circumstance cases, but they were all LWAP. I did too. One, for one reason or another, they didn't seek death or they considered it and then withdrew it kind of at the inception of the proceedings. Yeah, I, I had a number of LWAP cases as well. Yeah. So, so we have about 20 minutes left on this panel. And I, like I said, I had questions for each of you and I suspect my questions might generate others. So I'm gonna start with Professor Kennedy. Uh, Professor Kennedy, can you talk a little bit about Prop 66? Um, what, sure. what it means politically, let's just start there. What it attempted to do legally and what has been the effect, if, if any? Yes, I think, um, <clears throat> Uh, Chair Romano, I think Prop 66 reminds me a lot of the uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996 on the federal side. So there is a perception that um, the California death penalty system is broken, is dysfunctional, right? The former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court used that language. And so Prop 66 is an attempt to say the problem isn't the issues that are inherent to the, ca the California death penalty, you know, that it's cost, it's discrimination, the mistakes. The problem is that there are all these delays that are caused by the courts and people over litigating. So it puts people on a schedule much like the EDPA in federal court did. And the belief was that it would uh, speed things up and we would finally have a working death penalty. Speaking only for uh, uh, myself, it, it doesn't seem like it's achieved the, the goal at all because the California Supreme Court has taken itself off the timelines. You know, it's adjudicated itself exempt uh, and it has uh, uh, the proposition removes the idea of a centralized state Supreme Court adjudicating the habeas cases and then returns them to the individual uh, state trial courts to adjudicate. Now, as someone uh, uh, who is teaching students to do post-conviction litigation in the state courts, many of the judges in superior court uh, have no affinity for state habeas corpus and don't want uh, to do that stuff. So there's an enormous resistance to following state habeas corpus practice and procedure. I'm sure the judges do the best they can, but they are not uh, 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 people who have done extensive habeas in my experience. And then on top of it, perhaps most importantly, there is absolutely no arrangement for payment of counsel litigating the state habeas cases uh, uh, after uh, uh, Prop 66 because the previous statutory scheme guaranteed a payment from the California Supreme Court, which was gonna kind of oversee all of the cases. So we would have uniform application of the death penalty in the state of California. Now, not only do we not have that uniformity, we have no arrangement for payment at all. So the system has screeched to a halt. Uh, because there is no clear uh, vehicle for the payment of investigation, the payment of counsel for litigating the cases. And it appears there's some kind of a standoff regarding who will fund Prop 66. And I, I hate to put you in this position, but would you say that even the proponents of Prop 66 would agree that it hasn't achieved its goals or they think it's working? I, you know, I, I really can't uh, speak for them. All I can say is they have a, a real challenge before them. The EDPA was supposed to speed it up on the federal side. It slowed it down for over 20 years. And so I expect long delays from Prop 66. All right, um, Jordan Steiger, this, I, my question is, is somewhat related. Um, so you talked a lot about the, I guess the popularity, the death penalty, especially nationwide. and. Of course, I, I think we're all moved and impressed by what happened in Virginia yesterday. What is California to do though, when in three separate elections, voters seem to support the death penalty? Um, and I was just wondering what your advice would be to the California legislature, 
you know, or, or and, and governor uh, given that? I mean, the answer may be, well, it's unconstitutional and that's why we have a constitution because it's, you know, we're not necessarily following popular will all the time. Or do you think that those campaigns are not reflective of really the California voters or, sh or should we indeed try our best to follow the will of the voters? And as Justice Mourinho was suggesting, figure out a way if it's possible, if ever, and I realize the shortcomings of trying to, you know, fix the system. Um, Mike, before he answers, can we add, could you also, if you know, was there any analysis done like repolling or focus groups after the election where the, you know, getting rid of the death penalty went down and making the death penalty faster got passed? If you have any insight on that, if there was nope. actual analysis done. There's been tons of uh, polls as far as I understand. The one that I think really seems revealing to me and sort of struck me as exactly where California is, is where a majority of voters support the moratorium. This was a 2019 poll and support the death penalty, you know, at least for the most extreme cases. Um, you know, it's, it's a stalemate or I think Professor Kennedy said schizophrenic. Um, so I'm gonna put it to you, Professor Steiker. I, I, I appreciate that we could just say it's unconstitutional and doesn't matter what the voters think, but what, how do you address this so, so I have a few observations. I mean, I don't think I can really answer the hard question about what your role should be and how sensitive you should be to, um, you know, how voters, you know, when they're involved in direct democracy act and how to interact with the legislature. I mean, I, I, those are very difficult questions, but I do have some observations that are sort of general observations, not limited to California, um, which is, which is that there tends to be a higher level of support that is voiced when you're asked about the death penalty in the abstract, or even at the sort of in the Prop 66 way of, you know, do you want to make sure that death sentences are carried out more quickly in the abstract than when people are actually in the crucible of having to make decisions, when jurors have to make decisions, when prosecutors have to make decisions. Um, that there's, there's often a, a different sentiment and a different sensibility. Um, it's a lot easier to pronounce support for the death penalty as an abstraction as opposed to um, being involved um, on the ground. There's also, at the same time, there's also kind of a strange, as my sister was talking about earlier, the sort of politicization of the death penalty, which is, you know, a lot of actors can act recognizing that they will meet immediate needs without actually necessarily wanting to produce execution. So that there's, there's sometimes, sometimes the incentives in the system are corrupted and skewed where it's very easy for a local DA to, to make the political statement of seeking the death penalty, knowing full well that that's not likely to produce an execution and the incentives and the costs are often then spread out, you know, so that the state as a whole is going to bear the incarceration costs. The state as a, as a whole is going to bear the costs of, you know, post-conviction litigation, even direct appeals, and so on. Um, so I think it's a I think it's such a complicated process. And I also want to point out one other thing, which I think most people don't even realize when they think about the California experience, which is there's not a single jurisdiction in the entire history of the world where the death penalty was abolished through direct initiative or through direct democracy. No, no jur and you know, we now have you know, over 100 jurisdictions that have formally abolished the death penalty, 100 different nation states. None of them accomplished it through direct democracy. That, and that, the fact that California came as close as it did is actually extraordinary when looked at through the sort of broader lens of history that um, abolition of the death penalty has invariably come through um, courts and through um, legislatures that are somewhat at a political remove um, from decision makers, um, from voters. Um, that there's, it's, it's often a decision that's made on reflection rather than on 
um, sort of a thumbs up or down in a, in a sort of direct kind of uh, electoral process. So um, I think that's it's worth remembering and noting that California would have been the first jurisdiction ever to permanently abolish the death penalty through a direct democratic vehicle. I hadn't realized that. I share a lot of your intuition uh, though about people wanting it both ways to impose a death penalty, but never not knowing it's happening and spreading out the costs. I'm gonna ask you one more question that I think is difficult politically. And I wonder what your, is, what your reaction is. And then, and then Carol Steiker, I have a question for you. Um, what role does life without possibility of parole play in the abolition of the death penalty? And in the states that have abolished the death penalty, do they all have LWAP? Was that central to the campaigns and understanding? Let, let me go back a half step too about what you're saying about upon reflection. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Governor Newsom on the moratorium in California. And I think that he, you know, his experience with gay marriage in California was very similar, right? Voters had, um, recently rejected gay marriage and he just felt that it was important enough. And sure enough, years later, I think that uh, reflection, people strongly support uh, his position. But getting back to Elwa, um, our, the charge of our committee is well beyond death penalty. And we have heard a lot um, about LWAP in California and how horrific it is for um, thousands and thousands of people. Um, and, I was wondering how important you think LWAP is to the to the conversation about uh, abolishing abolishing the death penalty. Well, I'll be candid in saying that um, LWAP has been instrumental in a number of the jurisdictions that have repealed their death penalty statutes because um, it's a it, it's an easy sort of soundbite uh, that you won't have to worry about the offender. Uh, co you know, committing another violent act outside of prison. Um, and uh, every jurisdiction, I think, except Alaska, actually, which abolished the death penalty, it came in as a, in 1959, as a non-death penalty state. So I think every jurisdiction that um, has gotten rid of the death penalty has LWAP except Alaska um, as the alternative um, to the death penalty. Um, but, um, uh, my, my own view is, I think it's been a catastrophic mistake. I mean, I think that LWAP has made some, uh, some you know, legislators more comfortable with abolishing the death penalty, but without realizing the extraordinary costs of LWAP and actually how little it actually contributes to public safety. That you know, when you're dealing with um, people who are sentenced to long-term incarceration, um, you know, every criminologist realizes and recognizes the sort of diminishing, um, you know, the diminishing involvement in criminality as someone ages and, and the idea that you'll, you will, you know, condemn people to death in prison um, because of sort of this very, very small probability of dangerousness after many decades. Um, it just seems like it's a counterproductive policy in terms of costs, in terms of the humanity of it. Um, uh, and, but I understand that as a political matter, it makes it you know, a lot more palatable for people who are otherwise sort of on the fence about the wisdom of the death penalty to have LWAP as an alternative. Um, but you know, it's worth noting that around the world where you know, countries have abolished the death penalty, the United States is an incredible outlier in having life without possibility of parole. You know, all of the Western developed democracies that have gotten rid of the death penalty, um, I don't think any of them require the imposition of life without possibility of parole for aggravated murder. Um, so it's, you know, the United States is an outlier both in its retention of the death penalty and in its use of life without possibility of parole. Um, and um, and I, I think that, I think that history is not going to be kind to LWAP as sort of a as sort of a penological tool. Is it your sense that the states that have abolished the death penalty, that that has fortified the LWAP role, rule, or has it, is it, um, once we reduce our um, retributive impulses that maybe then LWAP is actually weakened once we eliminate the death penalty? Yeah, 
I think that would be an overly optimistic assessment at this point. I, to, this, to, to this point, the abolition of the death penalty has for the most part radically strengthened and expanded LWOP. A lot of jurisdictions that would not, that would otherwise not have LWOP, I think have LWOP because of the abolition of the death penalty. And many, many more people are serving LWOP that never would have been considered where the death penalty never would have been sought against them. So it's not just we've replaced death sentences with LWOP, we've replaced death sentences and then a whole range of offenders who would never have received the death penalty with LWOP. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's, a it's something that to consider about whether or not if LWOP were the, well, if LWOP were the, you know, the only punishment available for, you know, first degree or second degree murder or, or however it would operate it, uh, aggravated first or second degree murder in California, um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I think that becomes sticky. I don't think it's easy to, um, it's easy to unwind that even after the death penalty is gone. Yeah. You know, I, ironically, the DA's position, I forget which organization says that uh, uh, having uh, LWAP will increase the costs of prosecuting homicides. Uh, yeah. Is that they're, they're going to go to trial more often because you don't have the death penalty hanging over them. So it's, and then some, I, countries, some countries like Mexico, for example, won't extradite someone who's facing, uh, you know, LWAP. They want like a limitation, whether it's 50 years or 40 years before they will agree to extradite someone to the United States. I, I want to, I think that that's fascinating and a real difficult problem, especially, I know you haven't been privy, I mean, this committee has been really, um, um, I don't want to, I'm reluctant to use the word bombarded, but really struggles with the LWOP question in California because it's so um, huge. So it's, it's, I think it's on the forefront of our mind. Um, Carol Steiker, um, this may be super utilitarian for our purposes, but I would really appreciate your thoughts here. So you, 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 start off talking about, you know, and it resonated with me, especially with all the reading that we've done in preparation for today, with the countless reports that have been written about the death penalty, and of course yours. What would be your recommendation to this committee to make a report that actually advanced the ball, presum presuming it was in the direction that you supported? I mean, how can we make progress as opposed to just being one more uh, report on top of another, on top of another, pointing out the same issues and the same problems. Is there a way that you think that we might be able to actually, um, or, or how, how might you go about that? Well, I think there are a couple of things that a, a new report by this committee could do. One is, you know, all the questions that you committee members are asking us, like, focusing on recent developments like, you know, Prop 66, what happened after that? You know, um, what have been the trends? Uh, you know, Senator Skinner was saying, I wanna see what's happened over time, you know, what those trend lines are and the geographic, you know, um, clumping of the death penalty, like some really good graphics that make this, that make this pop for people to understand recent developments and also to understand how we've, we've tried and tried and tried and tried in the past to fix this thing and it's not getting fixed. So I think in some ways, you know, kind of doing a retrospective and seeing, you know, looking back and seeing the failures of past reforms and the failures of past recent initiatives and the trend lines can really make a difference in terms of shaping public opinion. And I think, you know, just to get back to the public opinion piece that uh, uh, you and Jordan were speaking to, you know, it's a common saying in the death penalty context that support for capital punishment is a mile wide and an inch deep. That if, you know, you wake someone up in the middle of the night and you say, do you support capital punishment? They're like, I'm in. But then when you make them aware of, you know, things they kind of should know, but aren't focusing on about, you know, the costs and the problems of wrongful convictions and the racial and ethnic disparities, they're like, yeah, maybe not. Um, or, you know, so I think um, 
you know, moving the 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 depth of that um, uh, public opinion is really powerful. And you see this. I mean, you, the the change over time in in support for the death penalty is really significant. And what kinds of things shape that? It's information like the kind that you all are gathering right now. So I would say it is a worthwhile project. You know, when we took on the ALI project, we were like, should we even do this? The ALI is the most dinosaurish, slow moving body. They're going to file this away in a box, like at the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and no one will ever see it again. And it's just going to be pointless. But amazingly, having written this report, the ALI actually voted to withdraw their support for their own model penal code that provided a template. And we, you are not the first legislative committee that we have been asked to testify before. And we felt like, God, that was totally worth it because it's getting attention from important people who can do something. So um, that's what I would say about how you might think about your report as one in a line of many. I'm, I'm curious to follow up on that. Does it, is it, I, I agree and I've heard the mile wide inch deep and um, you know, the various campaigns to try to eliminate the, cat, the death penalty in California, you know, were strapped for cash and didn't really have the resources to communicate the information. In the, in the, count, in the states that have eliminated it, has it been a leader is it, I mean, what is, what is, has there been something that's broken through? Has it taken a governor? Has it take, who, has there been, is there a common thread that sort of breaks the log jam politically? I mean, like, I mean, I, I do keep on coming back to the gay marriage piece because I think that, you know, that resonates particularly well for, you know, Governor Newsom, but, you know, we had, um, Prop 34 was on the ballot and Governor uh, Brown, you know, who is supposedly against the death penalty only came out in support of it after, you know, on election day, like after he had voted, I think actually. Um, so is it, is it, is it, does it, does it take a singular leader to stand up and say enough is enough? I and mean, what is breaking the log jam is, in your opinion or, or what might in California? I think often it is, I think it, every state has its own story. So I wish I could tell you there's a silver bullet and you just do this and that like triggers it. But very often there is a charismatic person or event that happens. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, in Illinois, you know, it was exonerations off of death row. Um, and then the governor appointed Scott Turow, um, you know, the famous novelist, but former federal prosecutor to a blue ribbon commission. And he wrote a book called Ultimate Punishment about he, how he went from being a death penalty supporter to a death penalty opponent. And I think that that really helped. Um, you know, I think in Virginia, it's changing demographics. In, you know, Maryland, the leadership of Congressman J uh, Jamie Raskin um, was tremendously important to Maryland's repeal. Like, I think there are... Um, uh, there are people, there are individuals and, you know, ideas and sound bites and events that are very important. And I think at each place, it's just, you know, kind of a unique concatenation of these things. Um, uh, in California, I think some of the things that, uh, that uh, Sean was talking about earlier um, are very much like the, the concerns about specific cases of innocence. Um, on the row and you know, demonstrated racial and ethnic disparities and geographic disparities. Plus that cost thing is insane. If you said to people, what could you do for public safety with half a billion dollars, you know, $500 million other than execute one more person, which has been the cost of each execution. You know, if you divide it all, it's a little tendentious, but still, I can't imagine anyone would say, no, I'll take that execution and, you know, you can keep your $500 million. So, you know, I feel like these are the things that um, are going to make a difference here. Thank you. We're about out of time for this panel. I don't know, Senator Skinner, it seemed like you had a last question. No. Okay. Um, so I want to thank you all, Stikers and uh, I almost called you Senator Kennedy. Professor Kennedy, I'm sure you've never heard that before. Um, any event, um, 
Thank you all. We really, we really appreciate it uh, because no good deed goes unpunished. Um, there's a likelihood that staff or I will probably reach out back to you for additional questions. We really do appreciate your time. Um, the committee is gonna take a 15 minute break here, uh, get some coffee and lunch and we'll uh, come back for, for the next panel. Do any of the members have any last minute uh, questions or item of business before I adjourn for 15 minutes? Uh, I just no. want to thank the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was tremendously helpful and informative. I really appreciate well, it. I just, want to, I just want to thank the staff for preparing a really great uh, summary of all of these uh, salient issues. And it was terrific. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Well, um, thank you all. Uh, we're going to adjourn for 15 minutes and uh, I hope to see you, see you around. All right. Thank you.